Michael, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, a very warm welcome to everybody for this year's new series of Zoom presentations. Um, <clears throat> as last year, we've got a full programme running through to next June, and I hope that people will uh, visit us every month. Um, we like to start off on a memorable note. Um, so we're, we're starting off with uh, our very own Honorary Secretary, Steve Harrison, who present is the Chairman of the Association of British Philatelic Societies. And he's going to talk to us about the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain. So over to you, Steve. Thanks very much indeed, Mike. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can I first thank Mike Roberts for inviting me to give this uh, presentation? And as it says, I'm going to be telling you about the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain. Hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you'll have an understanding of what Congress is about, why it's been going all the years that it has, and the sort of things that happen at Congress. So, really, when did it all start? It started in Manchester in 1909. A group of philatelists thought it would be a good idea to bring people together from all over the country and bring together like-minded philatelists. So I think you could say that it was in fact one of the first attempts to hold a national uh, philatelic event. It was organised by something called the Manchester branch of the Junior Philatelic Society. And it was held at Hume Town Hall. And it was February the 18th to the 20th, 1909. And you can see there on the side of the town hall, the picture of the town hall there, you can actually see the advertisement for the stamp exhibition. I'm sorry to say that the town hall has been demolished and is now under a dual carriageway. I hate to think that it had anything to do with holding the first Congress. So who were these people that got together? Well, here, uh, the top image is the uh, committee that uh, came together to put this first Congress together. And you can probably notice straight away the third person on the left is the Earl of Crawford, who of course um, is very, very well known in the Royal Philatelic Society. And I think as we go through, you will see that there are quite a few links between Congress over the years and the Royal Philatelic Society. Now, somebody suggested to me that the main um, way in which you could become a member of this initial committee was to have a very large moustache. Um, I can um, honestly say that the organising committee for 2022 doesn't, they don't have large moustaches. The image down there at the right is the opening ceremony that took place. And there again, standing next to the mayor in the middle, you have um, the Earl of Crawford. Um, one or two other names just to uh, look at that image on the top left. Uh, Albrecht was the uh, one of the, the, the main driving forces and also Bernstein, um, who is the uh, man next to the Lord Mayor. Uh, he was the, the chairman of the committee. They managed to get the post office to prepare a special hand stamp and for some reason, and I still can't understand this, this has been signed by Isidore Bernstein, the chair of the first committee of, of Congress, and he puts on there the first impression of the special postmark. And of all things, they chose an international reply coupon to put it on. I still can't understand why they chose that, but uh, it, it's quite nice for me because that's another area of collecting interest for me 
international reply coupons. So um, they were introduced in 1907. So two years later, they were being uh, used at Congress. As well as the Congress, a series of meetings and talks, there was also a postage stamp exhibition. And anybody who uh, lent material for the exhibition was presented with one of these glorious um, um, certificates. And as you can see, it's presented to Mr Higgins and signed by the Honorary Secretary Albrecht and Bernstein, the president. And that actually is one of only two known from the 1909 uh, Congress exhibition. One thing I do like collecting and one thing I have in my Congress collection are what I call real bits of ephemera. This is the lapel badge worn by the secretary of the Manchester Junior Philatelic Society, hence the initials on the badge and being a good sort of philatelist he's turned the badge over put a postage stamp on it and got the postage stamp cancelled so i like the idea that even on his lapel badge he got a copy of the uh, exhibition um hand stamp as all good um congresses have done over the years uh, a souvenir postcard was uh, produced. Uh, as you can see there, postage stamp and exhibition and philatelic congress under the auspices of the Manchester Junior Philatelic Society. On the right hand side, this is the first handbook. So all the um, talks, all the presentations were documented in that handbook. And since uh, the first one, every congress has had a handbook like that. And I'm pleased to say that I do have a, a full set, shall we say, of Congress handbooks since 1909. This is just a, a I think, a very, very amusing little postcard. Um, I thought I had a stamp about me and it's addressed to uh, Charles Farr and um, a copy of the exhibition um, Congress hand stamp is there. The second year, we move to London for Congress, and that's the feature that I'll point out to you that it's taking place in a different place each year. It's not static, it moves around the country. In an actual fact, it moves uh, overseas as well on occasion. There weren't any uh, labels, uh, souvenir labels for the first Congress, but here in the second one, they were actually prepared by Perkins Bacon. And you can see the four values that we have there, the green, the blue, the scarlet and the uh, brown. And that image um, of Queen Victoria facing to the right was taken, as you can see on the um, right hand side of the screen, uh, from a um, previously prepared design for a fiscal that uh, Perkins Bacon had prepared. I think that the quality of those labels is outstanding, absolutely outstanding. I'm lucky enough to have a proof of that um, design. It's in black on white glazed card. And to me, that is an absolutely, I know I bang on about it, superb design. And the interesting thing I find is that printers such as Perkins Bacon were prepared to uh, produce these souvenirs for Congress. At the Royal Philatelic Society, we have the Perkins Bacon archive. And within the archive, um, there is what they call the day book. And this is an image of two pages from the Perkins Bacon day book. And right at the top, you on the top left, you can see that it says, 1910 April and then just below that where the first red arrow is two so it's the 2nd of April 1910 design stamps for second philatelic congress of Great Britain and each item of work entered in the day book has been priced up and to design the stamp for the second philatelic congress of Great Britain 
cost 10 and sixpence, which is 52.5p today. And I think that's quite a decent price to get those labels produced like that. Right down at the bottom of the page where the second red arrow is, you can see there the 11th, and it says engraved souvenir stamp for PSOC Congress. So the engraving of those stamps, the engraving of the plate for those uh, labels, priced at three pounds, 10 shillings. And uh, I think that's a very, very good price as well. J just one thing, every time I see that page, Frank Walton found that for me in the uh, Perkins Bacon archive. He sort of sent over an email one day, Steve, I think this may be of interest to you. Well, it was, so thanks, Frank. The labels were printed in sheets of 12, as you can see, and were um, cone perforated. One sheet, one sheet was printed in gold and presented to the Prince of Wales, who obviously became later became King George V. And we believe that that sheet is still in the Queen's uh, philatelic collection. I have written on several occasions to the Queen, suggesting to her that it would be more appropriate to be in my collection than hers, but unfortunately I haven't heard anything from her. Um, I'm still waiting. The handbook for the 1910 Congress was a, quite a dramatic design on the front cover. And as you can see, uh, we have these two, two um, columns. And if you look carefully onto the columns, are written all the names of the philatelic societies that took part in the Second Philatelic Congress of Great Britain in 1910. And if you look carefully, top left, Royal. So the Royal Philatelic Society was there. Also, if you notice the pastiche of the Mulready design in the top frame at the left. Uh, and this second Congress was under the auspices of the Hearts Philatelic Society, and it was held at Caxton Hall in Westminster. The one feature of um, Congresses that's sort of grown over the years, uh, on the sort of the last evening of Congress, there's a banquet, and the menus have always been produced with uh, degree of um, design in mind. Uh, this is the 1910 uh, banquet uh, menu. And as you can see, it has that um, lovely uh, label up here at the top of the uh, menu. And that is based, as you can see from the images on the right hand side, on the uh, St. John's Newfoundland uh, one penny of 1862. Uh, I'd just say that over the years, uh, most of the ba uh, banquet menus were written in French, and I am absolutely positive that there are items in there in French that even the French wouldn't recognise. This is the um, banquet invitation for 1910, with again at the top in the middle, a very, very nice piece of engraving. 1911, we move to Birmingham. Um, and... Uh, where are we? 111 years later, it's coming back to Birmingham this year. Uh, the image, as some of you may recognise in the middle of those labels, uh, is Birmingham Town Hall. The labels were printed, printed as you can see, in four colours. And um, the handbook, that's the front of the handbook on the uh, uh, right hand side of the screen. And supposedly, the design for that cover was based on the front part of what then, in 1911, was called Curzon Street Station. Now, if you go to Birmingham, if you go in or out of Birmingham on the train, if you're going into uh, New Street Station, you'll probably have seen the uh, huge site that's being uh, built for the HS2 station. And Curzon Street Station, that building that's uh, there on the left-hand side at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's still there and going to be incorporated 
into the new HS2 complex. Uh, I put there when it opens in 2026. Um, if anybody wants to have a bet with me whether it will open in 2026, that's another story. The labels themselves were printed just by a, a local Birmingham printer. Um, because you had philatelists uh, in charge of this, uh, you do get errors in inverted commas. For instance, there's a, a block on the left hand side with the town hall inverted. Um, on the right hand side at the top, you have colours reversed. And they did, uh, for um, publicity, uh, overprint some of the Birmingham Delivery Company labels, as you can see there, Philatelic Congress 1911. Um, so never let philatelists look after the souvenirs because you never know what they are going to come up with. Now then, I've got a story to tell about this. Those two images are taken from two covers. As you can see, they are very, very, very philatelic. Somebody has cut uh, a tupney and a one penny in half and arranged them as you can see there. The image on the left is taken from a cover in my collection. The image on the right is taken from Francis Kittle's collection, which is now, of course, in the Royal Philatelic Society, as he was kind enough to donate that. Um, last June, I actually gave a display of um, Congress material to the Great Britain Philatelic Society at our Church Lane. And I actually showed my cover, the one where you see on the left. And I did make the point to the people in the room that we were on the uh, first floor of the Royal and three stories below in the vaults was the other cover, Francis Kiddle's cover. And I'm just wondering whether it was the first time that those two covers had been in the same building at the same time since 1911. Nice thought, and it's just nice to see them both together, I think. One aspect of all Congresses is that you do have trips out, visits out. And in 1911, uh, a trip was organised to the uh, Cadbury's Chocolate Factory, which, as some of you will know, is just on the outskirts of Birmingham. The other trip was to Warwick Castle. And in 1911, Warwick Castle was a private residence, the home of the Countess of Warwick. And on the right hand side there, you can see an image of the Countess with somebody called Richard Hollick, who was the chairman of the Birmingham Philatelic Society at the time, and also chairman of the Congress Committee. So there we have a group of philatelists at a chocolate factory in 1911. Right at the end of Congress, um, the organising committee pulled together a sort of a scrapbook, shall we say. Um, it had got blocks of all the 1911 labels in it. It had got picture postcards. They produced one of the Countess and also a, a similar set of all the members of the committee. Uh, they included original photographs of the visit to Warwick Castle, the programme events, banquet menu and other such souvenirs. And I'm very, very pleased to say that I actually have that a souvenir, that unique book that was presented to the Countess in my own collection now. Moved 1912 to Margate. Uh, as you can see there, it was at the Queen's Highcliffe Hotel. Splendid building by the look of it. And uh, there's the Congress room illustrated at the bottom. Uh, so souvenir uh, postcard on the left, and that's the front of the handbook for 1912 on the right hand side. It was under the auspices of the Isle of Thanet Philatelic Society and was held, as I've said, at the Queen's Highcliffe Hotel. Quite interesting labels, I think, in six colours. They were printed, teshbesh, and rouletted. 
um, and you can see they're a, a full set. They were also produced, again, don't let philatelists look after the souvenirs, they were also produced in reverse colours, as you can see there. I'd like to introduce you to Albert Leon Adut. Um, he was uh, the managing director, actually, of the Queen's Highcliffe Hotel. He was a founder of the president of the Isle of Thanet Philatelic Society. He was Mar uh, mayor of Margate, Congress chairman, and also a fellow of the Royal. And it just so happened that when he was Congress chairman, he managed to get Congress to agree to use his hotel as the venue. Um, so uh, what's the expression we would use nowadays, perhaps entrepreneur. And did he get Congress to come to his hotel, but he also managed to get the printers who printed the souvenir labels to prevent to prepare labels there of uh, his hotel. So he had quite a good knack of advertising the place. That's just a cover with the six souvenir uh, labels on. One little thing to note is down at the left hand side, you can see there that the um, postage stamp has been cancelled, but the hand stamp produced for 1912 has also gone over onto the, onto the label. And really, that was contrary to uh, post office uh, regulations that the hand stamp should only be used to cancel postage stamps and not any of the labels. But um, as I keep saying, don't let philatelists in charge of the souvenirs. You do get oddities like this, where you get a, a New Hebrides five cent and 10 cent uh, bisected with a downy head and then uh, over um, printed over with the, the um, Congress uh, hand stamp and a copy of one of the triangular um, labels in the top right hand corner. This is, and I know it's dangerous to say this, this is the only postal order ever known to have been hand stamped at a Congress. Um, as you can see there, correctly uh, um, cancelled in the issuing office space, uh, but there with the, the Congress hand stamp itself. And uh, I have a friend who is a postal order collector and uh, he suggested to me that it's the latest known um, cancel on a King uh, Edward VII postal order. At the place setting of each gentleman at the banquet of the 1912 Congress was placed one of these envelopes. And inside the envelope, was a cigar. Uh, as you can see, the Congress hand stamp has been used to cancel uh, one of the labels and it's torn because they just tore open the envelope to get the cigar out and smoke. So as it says there, it all ends in smoke. Um, I can assure you that at the 2022 Congress, when we have our uh, banquet, we will not be giving everybody a cigar to smoke. So we moved to 1913 and it went all the way north to Edinburgh. Uh, there on the left, I think he's a really, really attractively designed um, invitation to the uh, banquet of the Fifth Philatelic Congress held at the Barrel Moral Hotel in Princes Street. And uh, again, a label. Um, sorry, a stamp has been affixed with the uh, Congress hand stamp over the um, top of it. And on the right hand side, you can see the front cover of the handbook for that year. You'll notice both on the um, banquet uh, invitation and also the handbook, you've got their copies of the labels, one in scarlet, one in blue, that were prepared. It features the top of one of the churches in uh, Edinburgh. 
skipping to 1914, it came back to London. And I, I said to you right at the beginning that as we work through this history of Congress, you see connections with the Royal Philatelic Society. And if you look there on the right at the front cover of the handbook for that year, it was held in 1914 under the auspices of the Royal Philatelic Society London, with a comma in those days, at 4 Southampton Row, Hobart, London, which of course were the premises for the uh, society at that time. No actual labels were produced, but this beautiful piece of engraving was produced, which went onto the front, as you can see there, of the uh, of the handbook. Rather a nice uh, piece of engraving that I think, with uh, interesting heads on as well. 1920 from London, it went up to Newcastle. And um, obviously there was a gap from 1914 to 1920 because of the First World War. And the first um, Congress after the war, you'll notice on the front cover of the handbook there, right at the bottom, you have the word Pax, celebrating the peace after all those years of war. And there's the label that we have on the uh, left-hand side that was prepared. Now, I think that the labels on the left-hand side were prepared for Congress by a group of people who didn't know Newcastle very well, because on the handbook, if you notice, on the right-hand side, it says Newcastle upon Tyne, which is the correct name. On the labels that were prepared, it says Newcastle on Tyne. And some of the local philatelists were so aggrieved that the name had been put on the labels incorrectly that they actually printed some of their own sort of um, copies of these with the name spelt correctly. 1921 was quite an important year for the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain because Congress actually introduced the role of distinguished philatelists. So I would make that point that RDPs, the role of distinguished philatelists was instituted by the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain. As I say, role of distinguished philatelists was introduced for the first time. The 43 deceased philatelists were noted for being the uh, fathers of philately. And on the right hand side there, you can see the role um, of distinguished philatelists going right up there to Bath in 1935. We jump now to 1922 when Congress was held in uh, Bath. And the image on the left hand side there, that is the um, front of the handbook for that year. And again, a marvellous piece of uh, engraving and design, I think. And on the right hand side, again, don't let philatelists play with uh, souvenirs. There you've got overprints on stamps. Go to Bath, Ninth Philatelic Congress. And again, for the four days. Skipping a year and going to 1924, it moved to Glasgow. And um, quite an interesting design for the labels that year, I think, uh, as is illustrated on the left hand side there. The central motif is the arms of Glasgow, showing the uh, uh, connections with the fish and let Glasgow flourish. And that same image of the uh, arms of Glasgow was used on the front of the um, Congress handbook, as you can see there. And again, a very, very nice piece of uh, design and layout. Skipping to 1927, uh, just a cover that was produced with the um, Congress hand stamp, as you can see quite clearly there. Um, handmade special delivery for Philatelic Congress label affixed. And that was going to uh, a place called Czechoslovakia. Uh, Rumour has it that people do collect um, um, material from that country. Also, 1927, I spoke earlier about the uh, visits and trips out that were organised. In 1927, there was organised a visit to the 
local sorting office. And I think that even if some of us here went on a trip to the sorting office, this would happen as well, because um, as people went in, they were given the sheet on the left hand side. It's a uh, full scap sheet of paper and it lays out all the um, facts and figures for the uh, Nottingham sorting office. And what's happened is that somebody has folded that up and as they walked around their trip, they've literally grabbed any hand stamp they can and had a go with it. So you can see they're quite an interesting collection of hand stamps. And I bet you if a group of people from this meeting went around a, a, a sorting office, probably the same would happen even today. 1928, just to mention that you've seen the handbooks uh, over the years up till this point, and they've all been sort of very, very lavishly designed on the front. From 1928 onwards, um, and I don't fully understand the reason why they decided to standardise the design of the handbook and uh, produce, dare I say, quite a boring uh, hardbound tome, as you can see there in 1940, uh, 1928, contain copies of all the papers that were going to be presented at Congress. And of course, in 1928, Congress ran concurrently with the London International. Spoke earlier about books. Um, this is the, I think, absolutely superb banquet uh, menu that was produced for the 1930 uh, Congress in Torquay. Um, all that just for a banquet menu. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And on the left hand side, you can see there the first involvement of um, philatelic um, professionals. Right down at the bottom, you can see that. It's a souvenir of Congress with the compliments of stamp collecting. Philately House, St. Bride Street. And what a group of philatelists looked like in 1930. Absolutely superb group, I think. One or two faces that perhaps some of you will recognise from the staircase in Abchurch Lane. And I do worry, however, about that uh, group of gentlemen uh, who were asked to sit cross-legged um, on the floor at the front. I do hope that some of them were given uh, assistance to get back up. And you can see right in the middle of that group is the uh, mayor of Torquay with a very, very, very impressive uh, regalia on. So, um, yes, philatelist in 1930, an interesting group. 1931, for some peculiar reason, somebody used a flyer advertising the Portsmouth Navy Day, put a couple of stamps on it, got two um, hand stamp uh, impressions on it and sent it to GPO Alexandria in Egypt. Never trust philatelists to handle souvenirs. This, I'm jumping now to 1933, and this, in my opinion, is one of the best sets of labels that's ever been produced for Congress. It was produced by Delarue, and you can see there, there are seven different colors, and each different color was printed on a different type of paper. And if you turn these labels over, it's very, very obvious that they're different types of paper. So uh, the black top left was printed on wove handmade, and so the list is there in front of you. Um, absolutely uh, super, super designs. The quality of the engraving, the quality of the printing, very, very uh, uh, pleasing. And that uh, image that was used for the labels uh, on the left hand side, you can see that is actually a piece of sheet music. I do actually have a uh, a full size copy of that. Uh, it was a song from Victorian times called The Postman's Knock. And um, Delarue had taken that image and uh, modified it only slightly uh, to be the image for the labels for that year. So that's 1933. I'm jumping to 1935. Uh, in 1935, the label. Uh, there on the left, there is an imperfect proof sheet of the labels, and on the right, um, a, 
uh, a proof, die proof of the uh, outside design of one of the labels. And again, Perkins Bacon, very happy to produce these for Congress. I'm jumping to 1940. In 1940, Congress had been scheduled to be held in London, but obviously with the outbreak of war, it was felt to, uh, or close to the outbreak of war, I should say, it was felt to be better to move it uh, to the coast and it was moved to Bournemouth. Um, the um, labels, souvenir labels, were produced by Perkins Bacon in uh, blue and black to correspond obviously 1840 1940 it was the centenary of the adhesive postage stamp and they were produced in blue and black and 5,000 uh, copies of that were produced and if you notice they omitted the corner letters what i find amusing are the two um, items on the right they're both um, admittance um, tickets one at the top is for the philatelic writer's breakfast. The one at the bottom is for the philatelic, uh, philatelic service. But you'll notice that the breakfast was from 8.30 to 10.30. It ended at 10.30 to give everybody time to get from breakfast to the philatelic service at St. Peter's Church, which started at 11.15. The other interesting thing I note is that the preacher of the service was the Reverend C.S. Morton and Morton uh, was the secretary of the organising committee, Congress organising committee, for many, many years. He didn't actually have a stipend of his own. He seemed to float around sort of doing uh, what you call it, relief service and doing, a, 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 you know, preaching here and preaching there. But I do like the idea that um, those um, those tickets were issued. It's not encouraging that they're only number two and number three. Uh, I'm just wondering how many people they did get to the philatelist service. Skipping from 1940, obviously, Second World War, after the Second World War, uh, 1946 was held in Brighton. I just mentioned the Reverend Morton on the last slide. Um, there you see the um, committee at the opening ceremony for the 1946 Congress. And there right in the middle is uh, the Reverend Morton. I also find it quite interesting that um, there's one of the members just sitting there quietly smoking a cigarette. Um, again, we will not have people smoking at this year's Congress. One thing I do like about uh, the 1946 Congress, that the Congress Organising Committee actually um, got the post office to produce a unique registration label just for use at the Congress post office. I, I should add that most years, a sort of temporary mobile post office was established in the um, um, entrance hall of the uh, hotels. So um, that is a, a unique item that was produced just for 1946. Jumping 46 to 1948, there on the left hand side we have two of the RDPs of the new um, uh, signatories to the role of distinguished philatelists, M. Brun and Samuel Gravenson. Uh, mature, sensible looking people. And on the left hand side there you see the um, souvenir labels that were produced for 1948. One tradition, habit, whatever you want to call it, that seems to have built up over the years is that at the banquet uh, the menus are passed around and uh, one tries to get as many um, autographs as you can. And if you look over that you will spot one or two names um that um but there is one can i just point out to you somebody assigned baden powell um don't quite understand that adrian hopkins some of you will recognize the name of um but it's it's interesting to just look at that and see who was there at that event in 1950. 1950 i'm jumping into 1952 
And there again on the right hand side is the program for the uh, RDP ceremony. And as you'll note, it says the World Distinguished Philatelist 1952 under the auspices of the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain. Quite a pleasant little cover was produced. And again, the usual hand stamp. From 1952, also uh, another example of a signed uh, menu for the annual banquet. The, the event that year was held at the Polygon Hotel in Southampton. And one thing I never, ever, ever thought I would do is to show a beer mat um, in a display. But somebody there has got one of the Polygon Hotel beer mats, put a stamp on it and got a copy of the hand stamp on it. Um, somebody did say to me quite recently when they saw that item, if it's the Polygon Hotel, why is the beer mat round? 1953, um, Whitley Bay, and there's a copy of the Congress hand stamp on a Commonwealth reply coupon. Um, about, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, I, I actually found that and showed it to one or two friends who also collect Congress material. And they said, oh, it's unique. We've never seen that before. Um, so I put it in uh, a little publication and saying this is a unique example. To date now we have 12. So um, I'm always uh, very uh, careful about saying something is unique. But it's, it's an oddity, Commonwealth reply coupon with uh, a Congress hand stamp on. 1953, I'm jumping to 1956 when it was held in Brighton. A very pleasant little cover was produced as you can see on the uh, left hand side there. Uh, the image is taken from the Indian Gate at the Royal Pavilion where the event was held. And on the right hand side, I'm pleased to say that I've got the original artwork for that envelope. And you can see how the, uh, the uh, Indian Gate has been used stylistically um, on that piece of artwork. We jump from 56 to 59. Obviously, it's the Golden Jubilee of Congress, 50 years, 1909 to 1959. And it was decided that they would introduce something called the Congress Medal. It would be awarded each year to an outstanding philatelist who had made a contribution um, to things and uh, or, or display or a book. And that on the right hand side, that's the original artwork, the uh, sketches uh, produced by somebody called Ernest Hugen, who again was the secretary of the Congress uh, Organizing Committee for many, many, many years. And those are his ideas. Um, as you can see, it says six, seven, eight, uh, nine and ten. I do have another sheet with the other five designs on. And funnily enough, I don't know. Um, it was uh, design number 10, the rectangular uh, design that was then taken forward. And uh, it, so it was almost a plaque rather than a medal. Jumping from 59 to 61, there we've got um, the Congress when it went to Blackpool. Obviously, you've got to have Blackpool Tower. Um, the postcard on the right, that building is a hotel. It isn't a prison camp. Um, I, I just think it looks absolutely so austere. But I suppose if you're spending four days of Congress inside, the outside, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Some of you may or may not uh, recognize Gavin Fryer there. Uh, at the 1997 Congress in Coventry, he gave an amusing talk um, dressed as, and you can see the photograph there on the uh, display board of George Higlett. George Higlett uh, attended Congresses for many, many years and always produced little um, amusing anecdotes and stories. And uh, at the 1997 Congress, Gavin uh, did an impression of George uh, reading some of his original work. And as you can see there, there's the uh, Congress banquet uh, with the uh, Congress hand stamp on those labels there. 
in the year 2000, he came back to London and it was one of the offices of the Revenue Society of Great Britain. And as you can see there, they used uh, a revenue stamp uh, from Canada as the uh, label, I suppose you would call it, for the 82nd Congress. 2008, it moved to Stratford-upon-Avon. And those labels that we see there uh, were actually produced uh, by a charity in Coventry, uh, they, sorry, in Stratford. Um, they were produced and sold to raise funds for the, um, um, for, uh, for the uh, birthplace of um, that. So actually those labels weren't produced by Congress, but were used by Congress, shall we say. And on the right hand side, uh, you can see the, uh, the Congress handbook for that year with Shakespeare's birthplace. It had to be uh, illustrated on the front. 2009 marked 100 years and Congress that year was in Manchester. Uh, I'm just illustrating there one of the uh, souvenir postcards that was produced on the left hand side and on the right hand side more of the uh, other souvenirs that were produced. So from 2009 I'm going to leap to 2011. Um, strangely enough um, they produced a set of postcards commemorating all the previous um, congresses and as you'll see there there's that uh, part of the um, hand stamp I showed you earlier on. The Grand Hotel on the left where it was held and you can see other things that you can recognize from earlier on in the uh, uh, display presentation and on the right hand side the Philatelic Congress uh, banquet menu yet again. So 2011 I'm going to jump straight to Birmingham 2022. Congress start on Thursday. So as from tomorrow afternoon, uh, please don't try ringing me at home. I won't be at home. I will be at Congress. Um, this is the label that has been designed and produced. And um, it's actually been produced by a member of the Council of the Royal Philatelic Society. So I'd like to say thank you to Mike Hoffman for his design skills there. And if you are desperate to get copies of these, if you come along to Congress Thursday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday, you will be able to purchase copies of that. And um, I believe there is no truth in the rumour that copies will have inverted town hall. I'm just going to finish with these gentlemen. I just wonder when they started everything in 1909, whether they realised how much they were starting, what they were starting and what, how long that would go on. So thank you to the organising committee there, because I think that they've done an awful lot for Philately over the years. And hopefully Congress will keep going for many, many more years yet. Um, if you're interested, Torquay next year, all being well. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Excellent. The good news is that you've so shocked our attendees that only one of them has written anything in the way of a question or statement in the chat. So, but seriously, everybody else, if you want to ask a question, that now's, now's a good chance to do so. Um, Steve, you, you mentioned the Polygon Hotel in Southampton, which was the venue, um, I think you said for the, was it 1950 something? Yeah, yeah. Nin 1952, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Keith Burton has reminded us that actually a polygon yeah, a circle is a polygon with an infinite number of sides. So, although, <laughs> well, although, I, always, I always thought a polygon was a dead parrot. Ah, 
Anyway. You uh, watch the wrong programmes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Simon Martin Redmond asks, can we see the Torquay Mayor picture again, please? Would you mind sharing that particular? Yeah. Let me see whether I can find it. I was right. Just to the right of the Mayor, very apt today, Jacob Rees-Mogg sitting next to him. <laughs> 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 Do you know, Simon, thank you, because I just missed that. I just missed it completely. So thank you very much indeed for drawing that to my attention. Yes. I must, uh, I must point that out the next time I give this. this very, point. very relevant today, of course. Yeah, yeah, very, very. <laughs> Excellent, Simon. Thank you. Shows my photo recognition in my Navy days wasn't wasted. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> Wicked. Anyway, that those were the only two questions that I've had. So um, I think I'd like to hand back to you. Thank you very, very much, Stephen. That's. Um, I mean, it was so different, so so different because we we heard about handbooks, certificates, adhesives or labels, as you said, um, the banquet menus, numerous types of ephemera and the souvenirs for philatelists and the visits out. Um, and most of the earlier ones before it was standardized were done with this marvelous um, artwork, which made it extremely good for th this sort of presentation. So that's my first point, so different, really good. And then it's so clearly presented. This, that's one of the best presentations from a slide point of view I've seen in a long time. Um, very simple format, very easy to understand and uh, really good quality. So thank you very much for that. And lastly, so informative. Um, there may be an awful lot of people in the audience who know a lot more about the Philatelic Congress of Great Britain than I do, but I learned quite a lot. So. Thank you very much for that as well. And it was interesting to see the presence of the Earl of Crawford again. Yeah. Um, so I think from, you know, Manchester in 1909, we've come a long way and the history was very interesting. So look, the first presentation of the year, thank you very, very much. I think it was really good. And I, I now like to ask our president, along with Mark, to present you with your virtual certificate of appreciation thank you um mike and stephen just a, a, a first of all an apology from margaret morris which i thought i'd mentioned because she um is as you know um living in glasgow um and she likes these zoom meetings but today she wasn't able to come so she sent her apologies Secondly, I'd like to um, uh, suggest that the 1913 um, picture, which I think was on the front of the menu, uh, was in fact the Scott Monument in Edinburgh, mm. rather than the top of a church, which I think yeah, you said. Yeah, yeah. Thank uh, you, Peter, you're um, correct, yeah. And um, then I'd like to say that Richard Horlick, um, I thought was an absolutely splendid fellow. And I think we should all wear boaters like that when we go to philatelic <laughs> meetings. Um, I, th I think it's, it's really quite important to maintain the standards. <laughs> to say nothing of the 1930s, where I know, you know, there may be one or two um, irksome politicians in view, but um, actually, I think you could take a very similar picture now of, of a bunch from the Royal Philatelic Society of London, and it really wouldn't be very much difference. <laughs> anyway, um, Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Um, I, I, I entirely endorse what Mike has said. Uh, wonderful show, really fascinating. And uh, I, 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 for one, who rather missed out on Congress for quite a long time, um, had no idea how, how deep and how important and how um, interesting, particularly the early printings uh, of, of some of this material uh, was. And uh, of course, the, the whole idea of the role of distinguished philatelists, which a lot of people seem to think is, is some kind of ethereal international scheme, 
um, actually comes directly from Congress and it remains with Congress and what a great thing. So thank you very much indeed. It's now my pleasure to present you with your certificate, uh, which I will actually give you, I think, in a couple of days time, providing the railway system is working at all, um, when I will be in Birmingham for the next Congress. But I'd like to present you now with that. Mark, if you'd be so kind. There we go. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Thank you. Mike Hoffman has uh, actually had some uh, some questions that he's saved up in chat. And I think it, it, it might be worth uh, raising these with you, Stephen, as they are relevant to your to your talk today. Yeah, sure. If you don't mind. Somebody made a comment about the those labels that had Newcastle on Tyne. They suggested that actually it was because of a lack of space that they that they that they abbreviated the word upon down to the word on. But there we are. And uh, yeah, there was um, one of those banquet um, menu things had um, a cat on it, didn't it? Yeah, it was very nice. Um, Michael uh, Michael Blaine, who's one of our guests today, uh, has asked, "What actually determines the venues?" Um, I think. When you say that you're thinking more michael of what determines the location rather than the actual venue um to be quite honest it's the enthusiasms shown by local philatelic societies because we do like to work i should explain by the way that now i am still the chair of the organizing committee for congress so i've sort of got a very um deep interest in it still um and it's if we can find a location that has a philatelic society that is keen to help and support. I mean, for instance, last year we were in Harrogate and the Harrogate Society was really, really supportive. And also the Leeds Society came over and was very supportive. And that just brings something extra to Congress when you have the enthusiasm of the, the local philatelists coming in. Um, with regard to the actual venue, um it's it's finding the right sort of hotel with the right sort of facilities and price and price yes yes cost is obviously an important consideration isn't it yeah it's, it's quite interesting that in 1910 when it was in birmingham it was held at the grand hotel which for those of you who know birmingham is directly opposite to the cathedral and that hotel ran it down and down and down, was derelict for many years, but about five years ago was completely refurbished and is absolutely superb now. It has a double storey um, banqueting suite, banqueting room, which is wonderful. So um, in my naivety, I thought, wouldn't it be splendid after all these years that Congress is coming back to Birmingham? Let's go and talk to the people at the Grand Hotel. Um, when they suggested that for the one night that we would like the banqueting hall for um, Congress banquet on the Saturday evening, that one night would cost me seven and a half thousand pounds. I thought, mm, I think I'm going somewhere else. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we didn't go back to the same venue as in 1910, but the hotel's still there. Right. Um, Alan Moorcroft has a question for you about the label for the 1921 Congress. He said it included uh, King George V's head. And so his question is, who printed the label for that Congress? Just 1922, oh, did you say? 1921. 1921. Uh, that was, 1921 was Harrogate. And the only label produced for that was actually produced by the um, publicity department of the local council. Um, so I is that the one that includes King George V's head? No. Okay. Um, I'm just looking for that. I think in that year it was. Um, was it 1940, Stephen? 1940. No. Ah, yes. Sure. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that was uh, Perkins Bacon. 
I believe. 1940. Yeah, 1940. Was, uh, it had the uh, at um, at the Penny Black, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, no. I was no. Uh, so, sorry. I was asking about the 1921, the Labour, which got the three three different heads on, including George V. Oh right. Oh no, that. I think that one that you're thinking of, Alan, is 1914 in London. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, yes, you're right. Yes, it is. 1914. Yeah, 1914 yeah. in London. That's got uh, Victoria in the middle and then yeah. the two kings on the outsides. That was when 1914, that was when the Congress was under the auspices of the Royal at Southampton Row. Right. And I believe that that was uh, Perkins Bacon again. Right. Right, thank you. Thanks. I could just tell you, if I may, uh, Stephen, that yep. in your early, um, in fact, almost your first slide of the Perkins Bacon head, uh, uh, Queen Victoria facing to the right. Yes. You showed a stamp and you, you, you cheerfully said it was another publication by Perkins Bacon that it had come from. I, I'm sure you know, but but it is a, in fact the first issue of Ceylon foreign bill stamps. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to find that. <laughs> the links to different people's collecting interests. That's right, Keith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the uh, yeah, yeah. You're quite right, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> but of course, it was it, it was a. It was a demonstration of the chaos at the time that they never put the name of the country on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, indeed. I, I take it that everybody who was using it knew which country they were in. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps they were forecasting the thought that it might change its name from Ceylon to something strange like Sri Lanka. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Okay, no. well, the, well, those are the questions. Um, Len Stanway also uh, mentioned about the 1913 monument or memorial uh, in, in Edinburgh as well, yeah, yeah. which we've spoken about. Um, I believe that Ian Gregg has a question. Ian, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Um, can I just first say that the very first philatelic meeting I went to was in the Polygon Hotel at Southampton. <laughs> um, can you just remind me, uh, you talked about the Congress plaque. What year was, did you say the plaque was introduced? Congress medal. Congress medal, that was uh, 1959. I thought it was because the RDB uh, plaque was introduced the same year. Yeah. Uh, and I actually have the original artwork here. Oh. 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 Sorry, the original artwork? Oh. The RDP plaque. It's in the wrong collection, isn't it, Steve? I, I, I think, Ian, that is definitely in the wrong collection. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Ian, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to spotlight you so that we can all see you. I'm going to. Of add, course. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, yep, yep, yep. I recognize that, Ian. Yes, that's very nice. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Right. Well, I think Ian's question was, was indeed the last one, as far as I know, until someone comes up with another question. Mike? Yes, OK. Well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that concludes the formalities.